So I want to welcome Bill Height to the Library of the History of Human Imagination and to one of our uh, TED-Med discussions today. Uh, Bill, welcome to the library. We're glad you're here. Nice to be here, Jay. Thank you. So, you know, there's so many places I want to start with you. I don't even know where to begin because you've had like four or five different careers, it yeah. sounds. But why don't we start at the farthest uh, up here? Uh, encouraged about the near-term future of health in the United States? Very. I think that we're becoming more and more sophisticated about the causes of disease. And as we become more sophisticated, we can do more about preventing people from coming down with these horrible things. So up to now, so many people have said, you know, the healthcare system in the United States clearly has evolved in an environment that's very different to the one we have today or the mm -hmm. needs we have today. Some people say it's a sick care system in many ways, more than a health care system. And I just heard you use that sort of magic P word, prevention. Uh, is the focus of the next 20 and 30 years of where we're going to have real success going to be in figuring out how to make prevention more successful? Or is it really going to be in just having much more sophisticated intervention? Well, I couldn't agree with your phrasing more because I Never thought we really had a healthcare system. Right. We had a disease care system, but we should be striving for a healthcare system. And I think the leadership of the country and the pharmaceutical industry and uh, those who really care about this are taking this very seriously. So when we talk about health, there's not a lot of money in health, generally speaking. <laughs> and, and pharmaceutical companies are giant organizations that have multi-billion dollar research budgets. They have shareholders to answer to. This is a complex environment for which they are very high up on the food chain. Sure. How does a giant pharmaceutical company wrap its mission around health when there isn't enough profit to justify that that I can see? There's already companies on the diagnostic side that are springing up all over the place yeah. that are trying to predict um, and they're getting more and more sophisticated at what you will be susceptible to. And there's a business in that. Sensors. Sensors right. or just deep, deep, deep sequencing. Uh, right. You know, Gene things, sequencing. Yeah, right. things that now can tell us with pretty good predictive value that you may get diabetes by the time you're 50. Mm -hmm. um, but this particular patient won't, but is more likely to get a cancer and even more sophisticated what type of cancer. That is a business that exists today, people who are doing those sorts of things. And then there are people who are very interested in accumulating massive amounts of other types of data, medical record data mm -hmm. uh, that help predict um, things that could happen to us with the idea that a, an intervention could be the business also. So let's talk about science and research in the United States, uh, a topic close to your heart. Um, the American government, uh, through the National Institute of Health and some of the military, has been an extraordinary funder of scientific research. How well do you think the public understands that the, one of the core engines of the medical successes we've enjoyed today in a technological sense has been driven by government research versus private investment? Yeah. I, I'm suspicious and have even seen some data that the general public is not even aware that there is a National Institutes of Health, yeah. right? Which is frightening because for so many years um, and hopefully we'll wake up and it'll be for many years into the future, this was the engine that drove uh, the medical advances that were made in the United States that were absolutely the envy of the world. When I was training there was no greater um, place to come for students from outside the U.S. to a great uh, university hospital or a great medical school uh, to be at the cutting edge of biomedical research that was fueled by the NIH, absolutely fueled. Today, the pay lines for a grant proposal, in other words, what you would have to, your percentile to get funding are around 7%. Right, that 7%. means seven percent of all the requests actually get funded that make it through a reasonable uh, vetting process. You have to be in the seventh percentile so, to get so, money. To get money, so that means ninety-three don't. If you're not in the seventh percentile, if you keep going at it, it turns out that overall maybe fourteen percent of the applications because they keep funded. retrying. Keep retrying, and 
more than 7% get into 7th percentile. Right. Uh, but that is a disaster right. because pe kids who are coming out of school who are unbelievably bright, who come into these biomedical research laboratories, who see that it's virtually impossible to sustain your career because you can't keep your grants funded, you can't keep, they're, they're leaving, they're leaving. Uh, many of the um, expats who were here um, go back to China, go back to India, you know, go back to countries where uh, they can get funding. Um, it is, I think, a, a real catastrophe uh, that there's not a clamor, an outcry that uh, the NIH has taken such a hit over time. And private industry really doesn't pick up that slack? I mean, giant companies like J&J certainly employ thousands yeah. of research scientists, but are you telling me, despite that, there's no room for those? You can't expand fast enough either? Well, giant pharmaceutical companies, great pharmaceutical companies, they were doing that pretty much all along. Right. They're, con they're been constant, although the pharmaceutical industry has contracted as well mm -hmm. on the research side. So it doesn't make up right. for what's happened. And the discoveries that are made in a university fuel right. what a pharmaceutical industry can do. Pharmaceutical industries, at, for the most part, pharmaceutical companies are not involved in basic discovery. Right. They're involved in discovery medicine. Well, because basic discovery could have a 10, 20, or 30 year horizon Absolutely. associated with it, and private enterprise simply can't That's afford, right. with a handful of exceptions, to even devote any resources to a 20 or 30 year possible payback. Exactly right. And unless we continue to support the universities that are doing really fundamental research, someone coming into the lab with a good idea and having the freedom to study it because they have funding, that will dry up the opportunities to develop the next generation of breakthrough medications, um, preventatives, uh, that will change the healthcare picture for the U.S. and ultimately the world. The Hippocratic Oath um, can be boiled down to a few words. It's actually quite a bit longer, I understand, but it's a few words. First, do no harm, mm -hmm. right? You're a doctor, first, do no harm. So I've got two issues. The first issue I have is, as doctors in the medical community, we do a lot of harm. Mm -hmm. right? uh, there's a lot of therapies that hurt a lot of people. There are a lot of um, you know, uh, x-rays and, and CAT scans that are unnecessary that lead to long-term effects that we can't seem to figure out how to get out of the system. Needless to say, uh, uh, super-resistant uh, bacteria in hospitals make them among the most dangerous places in the world to go when you are well, let alone when you're sick. Uh, we do a lot of harm, and that erodes so much of what we're all about. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, are we doing a good job, the first part of these two questions, in paying attention to doing no harm, or are we so busy in the medical community that we <laughs> sort of accept the harm we're doing as just a byproduct we just got to deal with? So first of all, I think that a career as a physician is, to me, one of the greatest things you could possibly do to people would entrust you with their care and, um, and, and treating their disease, treating their problems. So, um, and I am of the opinion that most, the vast majority of physicians never intend to do harm. Yeah, I don't think it uh, they, they, they intend to do good because yeah. that's hopefully why they go into it. But the system is screwy, right? And everyone's aware of it. Now, right. you know, if you're incented financially um, to give a certain form of therapy if you're an oncologist, or you happen to be a part of a radiology business, um, the incentives are screwed up because you tend to order more tests. Even unconsciously, right. It's, yeah. it's just, it's human it, 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 it unfortunately is. So the incentives are kind of screwy. Um, and as a result, um, there's waste in the system. So much of what we were talking about earlier, which is the idea that we need to bring the public into a much better understanding of what's going on yeah. in the machine that is changing their lives and in the one that is creating a future they want to be in, 
is going to reside in ability to talk in these kinds of stories. I think if we don't start to talk to the American public in ways that they can understand, in ways and in words and in stories that they can relate to, then we're going to be making a bed we don't want to sleep in. Mm. And at TedMed, this is a big issue for us. You know, we, we span the clinical, scientific, policy, regulatory, you know, uh, entrepreneurial worlds because we believe that horizontally bringing mm. people together in one space leads to opportunity and emerging things you'd never see otherwise. And yeah. it's why companies like J&J support TedMed right. because it, it's about that kind of thinking. But at the end of the day, it's not about us. It's about bringing that kind of thinking to the, to the world yeah. or we're not going to have a future we want, I yeah. suspect. Well, that's a fantastic thing to be taking on. And at the end of the day, it will, it will have to capture the imagination of some great leader right. who will say, you know, we can do this. We've got it. We've got it. Just like John Kennedy said, we'll send the man to the moon to say it's no less romantic a notion curing disease than sending a man to the moon. Let's get at it. Bill, I want to thank you very much for joining me here at the Library of the History of Human Imagination and being uh, my guest in the TEDMED conversation. It was a real pleasure talking with you, and thank you very much for your time and your insights. Thanks, Jane. I was glad to be here.